Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. I'm Janet Jalil, and in the early hours of Wednesday, the 22nd of November, these are our main stories. The Israeli government is considering a possible deal for the release of some of the hostages held by Hamas in Gaza in return for a lengthy pause in the fighting. The chief executive of Binance, the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, has agreed to plead guilty to charges of money laundering in the U.S. Also in this podcast, concerns rise in the UK about the number of people dying after cosmetic surgery procedures in Turkey. As soon as I woke up, the, the surgeon said you have to go. There was no talks about what to do afterwards with myself. I went back to the hotel and I started seeing blood. And the venomous two metre long green mamba on the loose in a Dutch city. After more than six weeks of conflict in Gaza, it's looking increasingly likely that dozens of people will be released on both sides and there could be a lengthy pause in the fighting which has claimed thousands of lives. Hopes are rising that dozens of hostages could be freed soon by Hamas in return for the release of more than 100 Palestinian prisoners. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been holding a series of meetings with the war cabinet and government ministers to discuss the proposed deal. Tonight we have a difficult decision, but it's the right decision. The security establishment supports it. The war effort will not be hurt, but will allow the IDF to prepare for the fighting to come. I say again, the war is continuing. The war will continue until we release hostages, until there will be a day after Hamas, and it no longer threatens Israel. This came after the U.S. President Joe Biden expressed cautious optimism. We've been working on this intensively for weeks, as you all know. I've spoken recently about it with both the Prime Minister Netanyahu and the uh, Amir Qatar. And my team has been in the region shuttling, shuttling uh, between capitals. We, uh, we're now very close, very close. Uh, we could bring uh, some of these hostages home very soon. But I don't want to get into the, into the details of things because nothing is done until it's done. Our correspondent in Jerusalem, Tom Bateman, told us more about the Israeli government's discussions. What we are getting a sense of really now are the contours of a potential hostage agreement. And a senior Israeli f- official telling the BBC that this would involve the release of around 12 hostages per day up to 50 in return for a four-day ceasefire now it's elsewhere been reported that israel would also release up to 150 palestinian prisoners and that would explain why we're seeing this meeting of the wider israeli government tonight because it would have to sign that off that measure could also be open to legal challenge but it's said that that could be done within 24 hours so if this deal is signed off tonight we may then get a statement from mr netanyahu or from the the government as a whole if it is signed off you're not going to look at sort of something happening on the ground immediately it's going to take a bit more time because of the potential for a legal challenge on the israeli side but then also of course the logistics of just doing any kind of handover on the ground and in return what would happen in gaza well i mean what hamas want is a ceasefire and the release of palestinian prisoners as far as we understand this deal the sense is you would have a ceasefire and and as that holds Hamas would then release more hostages per day now there appear to be some details around things like for example according to the same Israeli official Hamas having requested for six hours a day there'd be no surveillance drones to allow them to release the hostages without giving away sort of information about where Hamas are that kind of thing the Israelis are saying well they'd still have eyes over Gaza even though they would take away surveillance drones and balloons so it looks like there's some quite sort of detailed elements of this agreement and of course we're not party to all of the details but there would still be a substantial number of hostages being held by Hamas and 
Israel still wouldn't have achieved its aim of destroying the group. Absolutely not. I was listening to a briefing earlier from a former Israeli negotiator who's done a lot of these things in the past. And one of the points he made was that the Israelis, from a negotiation perspective, will have to put themselves in the mind of Yehya Sinwar, who's the leader of Hamas in Gaza and is basically making these decisions. Now, he's not going to want to release all of the hostages in the end because he will see keeping some of them effectively to use to shield himself from Israeli military action. So that may be why the focus at the moment is more on women and children by both sides being the focus of releases. It's clear that soldiers are obviously held as well by Hamas. And you would then assume that Israel will want to resume its military campaign. I mean, the army, it is suggested, would find it difficult to stop because it's on the ground. It might find itself a kind of sitting duck to attack. So you would then expect to see a military campaign resume. Mr Netanyahu has said that is what keeps the pressure on Hamas and gives them leverage to try and get the release of more hostages. But all of that is a tightrope that the Israelis are walking and it's why some of the families of hostages held have called for a far greater prioritisation of the release of hostages over the military campaign and the immediate destruction of Hamas. Tom Bateman in Jerusalem. Well, Daniel Levy is president of the U.S. Middle East Project and a former Israeli peace negotiator under Prime Ministers Yitzhak Rabin and Ehud Barak. He opposes Israel's military action in Gaza. He told my colleague Evan Davis what he thought had been happening over the past couple of weeks. I was briefed on the parameters of the deal almost a month ago, informally, before the Israeli ground incursion. And the terms of that deal sound remarkably similar to the briefing given by the Israeli uh, security official to the media during these meetings of the war cabinet. There's a lot of devil in the details. There's last minute issues to be closed. The last two weeks, some of the details have been around Israeli air surveillance, for instance, during the time of the release. But the basic point is, this is what's been going on. Prime Minister Netanyahu has been reluctant to go for this deal. The details have barely changed, if at all, and perhaps not in Israel's favour. It has been that Prime Minister Netanyahu knows that once you go down this route, the pressure inside Israel to secure further hostage releases is a new factor and could lead to much greater pressure to end the military operation. And that is something Netanyahu doesn't want to do because he neither feels that its objectives militarily have been reached, I would argue, unrealizable objectives, and the morning after, because that is when he will face the music and the commissions of inquiry will begin, and his hold on political power will become very precarious indeed. But Mm. if what the Israelis need to do is to tell their public, we've fought like tigers, and we've got a better deal. If that's what they need in order to get this done, then so be it. But this is not an expression of retreat by Israel. No no measure of that at all, is it? I mean, I, I am assuming after about four dozen hostages have been released, 12 a day for four days, we're back to full military offensive. Well, indeed. And in that statement that the Israelis are putting out, it does say the um, military action will resume immediately. However, The pressure inside Israel, the dynamic, the number that will be released during this initial deal is not the entirety of those being held alive. It is perhaps a third, a quarter, perhaps even less. So the pressure that has been mounting is likely to increase from the families and the friends and from society in general of those still left behind. There'll be a political process which says it's harder to keep the offensive going if, if there's a possibility of hostages coming out, which is, of course, presumably why Hamas took hostages, to use as leverage over Israeli authorities and the Israeli people. Exactly. So this leverage, as long as Israel was holding out not to do any deal, it was latent leverage. It wasn't coming to the fore. Now we're in the deal-making space, that leverage very much takes centre ground. The pressure in Israel changes. Perhaps we will see over time a shift in American, British and other positions. But when you see this extended period of quiet, maybe there will be more pressure to actually get to a ceasefire because the alternative, as Israel pushes its offensive and continues its offensive and it moves south, 
to the areas of Gaza where the entirety of the population have now been pushed to, a smaller space with a larger number of people, the likelihood is that there will be even more staggering civilian losses, casualties amongst children than we have already seen in this horrendous last few weeks of fighting. President of the US Middle East Project, Daniel Levy. A stampede at a stadium in the Republic of Congo has left at least 37 people dead and many others injured. After the army announced a recruitment drive, thousands of young men had flocked to the stadium in the capital of Brazzaville and queued for hours, hoping they would be picked. Instead, many lost their lives. Despite being rich in oil, Congo has high levels of unemployment, with the army regarded as one of the country's few reliable employers. Our Africa regional editor, Will Ross, told us more about what was known about the accident. Evidence from survivors seems to point to the fact that many people were stuck outside this stadium in in the centre of Brazzaville all day on Monday and some um, apparently grew frustrated at the end of the day and then tried to force their way in. There are some reports of people climbing over a wall. Others talk of, of a gate being pushed in. And then some survivors says that said that there was then a kind of crush and people were trampled on. Surprising in a way that it took... I think this happened around 11 o'clock local time on Monday evening, and yet it was, you know, 10, 11 hours until we'd heard anything about it. Um, But we're kind of waiting to hear about an official inquiry that the authorities say they're going to launch to find out exactly what the cause was. And I think I'm correct in saying that this was supposed to be the last day of this army recruitment drive. So perhaps people had felt quite desperate because... There aren't many job prospects in Congo. Many people there are desperately poor. Yes, and it's possible. We're not totally sure as to how many days the active recruitment was going on. But certainly last week, uh, the the, the military announced that they were after 1,500 recruits between the ages of 18 and 25. And they said that would go on um, for several days. But yes, it is difficult to, to find a job, especially for people in that age group. Unemployment officially is over 20%, but possibly quite a lot higher for, for people leaving school or people who have not made it to the end of school and have reached age 18. Um, so joining the armed forces is, is, a, is a, a very tempting prospect. And in, in many countries across Africa, when there's a recruitment drive like this for the army or perhaps for the police, you see extraordinary numbers of people turn up because of the desire to get a formal job. Will Ross. Since 2019, more than 20 people are thought to have died after flying from Britain to Turkey for cosmetic surgery procedures. Now the UK government has said it's planning to hold talks with the Turkish authorities to see what can be done to prevent more such deaths. Stephanie Prentice reports. A gluteal muscle lift known to insiders as the Brazilian butt lift involves a transfer of fat into the buttock area. It's one of the fastest growing cosmetic surgery procedures, but also one of the most dangerous, as it's easy to accidentally inject fat into a vein. That's what happened to one British woman who died undergoing the procedure back in 2019. And this week, a coroner ruled she wasn't given enough information beforehand to make a safe decision. The case has prompted officials to step in and say they'll be visiting Turkey shortly to discuss surgery regulations around all cosmetic tourism. That follows a UK government warning already in place after 25 deaths were recorded since 2019. Kimberly Sad spoke to the BBC about her experience getting breast implants and a tummy tuck in Turkey. It was nine o'clock in the morning. As soon as I woke up, the, the surgeon said, you have to go. Didn't give me no garments. There was no talks about what to do afterwards with myself. I went back to the hotel and I started seeing blood, like just growing onto my pads. So I had a look and my stitches had popped open around my nipple. Kimberly was left with an infection but survived, unlike one English woman who bled to death during the gluteal surgery in July. Her family is still fighting for justice and to see a full autopsy. While many surgeries are executed without issues, the dangers are documented. But hundreds of thousands of people travel there every year for one major reason. As Dr Nora Nugent, VP of the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, explains. Overwhelmingly, the reason is price. And there are a few reasons why there's such a price differential, but it is the main driving factor. 
We asked her if people travelling there are given enough information, in her opinion, about the procedure and about the surgeon. No. In the UK, I can easily advise someone how to look up and see that someone's a legitimate plastic surgeon, that a hospital is legitimate. It's much more difficult in other countries. And even if you go to the best surgeon in the world, if you cannot receive the aftercare, then it, it, all of this is a moot point if a complication happens. Complications do happen, but with a Brazilian butt lift costing around $4,000 in Turkey and double that in other countries, health officials have a fight on their hands to explain to people that the price may not be worth the cost. Stephanie Prentice. Residents of a Dutch city have been warned that an extremely venomous two-metre-long green mamba snake is on the loose. Police in Tilburg were alerted by the Mamba's owner on Monday night, who informed them that, quote, he was missing a snake. Ed Horton reports. A wanted poster with a mugshot of the coiled green Mamba has been issued by police, warning people that the snake is very dangerous, its bite extremely venomous. Anyone who does get bitten has been urged to seek immediate medical attention. Reassuringly, perhaps, the cold-blooded reptile is unlikely to go outdoors during the chilly Dutch winter and is apparently more likely to seek out warm, dark spaces. And if it finds that comfort, police have assured people it will be passive and is not out to seek confrontation. Ed Horton. Still to come? I just want her back in my arms and squeeze the life out of her. I miss her singing and dancing and performing. Her energy... We hear from the father of a nine-year-old girl believed to be held by Hamas. Every weekday morning, wake up to one big story from the African continent. Where does Africa stand in this conflict? How is Africa responding to the refugee crisis? With me, Alan Kasuja and Africa Daily. So what's it like living in an area where Boko Haram are active? One story from Africa for Africa. Our story. Africa Daily. That's Africa Daily from the BBC World Service. Find it wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Welcome back to the Global News Podcast. The chief executive of the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, Binance, has pleaded guilty to charges of violating anti-money laundering rules as part of a $4 billion settlement with U.S. regulators. Chang Peng Zhao, who appeared in a federal court in Seattle, is expected to stand down and to pay a huge fine himself, as our New York business correspondent Erin Dunmore explained. It's a $50 million fine uh, for CZ. As he's known, he will step down from his role as the chief executive of Binance, the world's largest cryptocurrency trading platform. Binance itself will pay a $4.3 billion fine. The company will also accept the appointment of a monitor. And this deal ends years of investigations into Binance. Now, the company pleaded guilty to knowingly failing to prevent money laundering and sanctions violations and allowing criminal actors to use the exchange. Those were named today in a press conference by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen as including Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Hamas. And Attorney General Merrick Garland did not mince words today. He said that Binance prioritized its profits over the safety of the American people, and he said that it grew to be the largest crypto exchange in part because of the crimes it committed. He said now the company is paying one of the biggest corporate penalties in U.S. history. But it is still being allowed to carry on uh, trading, although it will have to accept the appointment of a monitor. Exactly. It will accept the appointment of a monitor and Mr. Zhao will not be able to have his hands on the business for quite some time now, for years. And there are going to be implications for the wider crypto industry here because Mr. Zhao is one of the most influential and most powerful figures in this industry. And this is not the first big shockwave that we've seen to crypto even this month. Remember, Sam Bankman-Fried, who was the founder of the FTX crypto exchange, was found guilty of fraud and money laundering earlier this month. And so these are some major shocks to go through the crypto world today with CZ. So what does this tell us about the state of cryptocurrency trading and how is it doing right now? 
Well, with crypto right now, a lot of the conversation revolves around enforcement here in the United States and regulation. And in fact, when we saw the Sam Bankman Fried trial going on in the U.S., there were a lot of calls for greater regulation in this industry. You know, it's something that has to be worked out in Washington and in line with the, with the regular financial system here. But you see a lot of push and pull. And when I talk to sources who include former federal prosecutors and other defense attorneys, they said that there's a lot of work to be done. Erin Dunmore. The UK's largest library, the British Library, has confirmed that employee data was taken in a cyber attack almost a month ago and that it's still affecting services. The Rice Cedar Ransomware Group claims it has library staff's passport information and is auctioning access to this and other data files for around $800,000 on the dark web. The BBC has not been able to verify these claims. Here's our technology editor, Zoe Kleinman. The British Library is the country's largest, housing a copy of every single book published in the UK and Ireland. At the end of October, it was hit by a simple but nasty ransomware attack, believed to have come from a Russian group. Ransomware is malicious software, often sent by criminals via attachments in emails and used to gain access to a computer or network. The sender can then find and encrypt important or sensitive files and demand a ransom for them to be unlocked. Professor Kieran Martin is the former head of the National Cyber Security Centre, which is assisting the library. He says it has not paid the ransom, so the group is now on to plan B. Now the criminals are threatening to sell the data to other criminals. Now that second threat's probably hollow. The data doesn't seem to be worth very much, so the library have made the right decision. If they pay, the criminals will just come back for other British institutions. The attack has affected the library's website, online systems, Wi-Fi and services such as book ordering. The organisation has warned the disruption could continue for several weeks. Zoe Kleinman. The Dutch are heading to the polls to vote in a snap parliamentary election that will bring in the first new prime minister in over a decade. The previous Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, whose government collapsed in July over differences in how to reduce the flow of asylum seekers, is not standing. So there's a sense of a new era beginning in Dutch politics, but whoever takes the helm will face an urgent to-do list, as Anna Holligan reports. The dominant themes in this election campaign have been the price of groceries, energy, a shortage of social and affordable housing, and access to health care. These issues have merged into one catch-all term, security of existence. Hello. Hi, Judith, it's Anna. Hi. I've come to visit Judith Honing. So many plants and so much light. You're a lovely place. Thank you. <laughs> Who's constantly thinking about ways to save money. Well... I can only spend my money once, so I had to make choices. And heating is so expensive that if I turn on the heating, I don't have enough money to buy food. I haven't turned on the heating in two years. Um, I also don't take hot showers every day. I do wash myself every day, but I have like a system with a bucket that I fill up and a small Um, scoop I used to uh, pour the water over me because it's a lot more energy efficient. Don't use electric appliances as much. Go to bed early. I often share my bed with my daughter because it's just warmer to share. What would happen if you did turn on the heating and if you didn't make those sacrifices? I either wouldn't be able to pay the bills (laughs) Or I wouldn't be able to eat. Billboards for the 26 parties have been placed outside Parliament. So let's just take you through some of the front runners. Peter Omzicht, his new social contract party was only formed a few months ago, but polls suggest it could do well. Franz Timmermans, he gave up an EU job to lead a new alliance between Labour and the Green Left. Geert Wilders, known for his populist anti-immigration policies, he said his Freedom Party would be prepared to compromise as part of a coalition. And Dylan Yasilgoz, she took over from Mark Rutte as leader of the centre-right conservative VVD and could become the Netherlands' first female 
and first immigrant prime minister. A video of her sparring with a heavyweight kickboxing champion was shared as part of the campaign. Dylan Yasilgos came to the Netherlands from Turkey as a child refugee, but has adopted a hard line on immigration. Across the Dutch political spectrum, though, anti-migration policies are discussed in pragmatic rather than inflammatory terms. And this debate has been overshadowed by daily challenges. So this is where you teach? Yes, this is where I teach. My name is Asha, Asha van der Helm. As we traipse through autumnal leaves, Asha tells me about her experience, which is not uncommon. Seven months of hardworking, 34 five houses visited I think <laughs> and it was the competition too much competition you're basically fighting for your position in this market buying wasn't an option no buying was not an option because I am a teacher and on a teacher's salary nowadays in Holland you cannot get a mortgage high enough to afford to buy any of the houses here in Holland Polls suggest a majority of Dutch people even those on middle incomes are concerned about the future And what they want most is a government that can secure their existence. Anna Holligan reporting. Let's return to our main story now, the events in Israel and Gaza. Among the relatives of the Israeli hostages, desperate to hear some good news after weeks of agony, is Tom Hand. His nine-year-old daughter, Emily, is believed to be one of those being held by Hamas. My colleague, Sarah Montague, asked him how he felt after the statement by the Hamas leader, Ismail Haniyeh, that an agreement on a ceasefire and a hostage release was close. Uh, To be honest, I haven't heard it. I don't have time to hear anything like that. Uh, But when I do hear things like that, my hopes are raised to the sky. And then when it doesn't happen, I'm, I'm crushed to the ground. Uh, I'm not going up to the highs because the the lows are too bad. So until I see it happening with my own eyes, I won't believe it. Have you heard anything about the possibility of how talks are going? No, nothing at all. Now, for Emily, I think she she would have turned nine the other day. Nine on the 17th of uh, November. Tell us about her. Tell us. Emily? Yeah, when you think of her, what do you think of? (laughs) Uh... I just want her back in my arms and squeeze the life out of her. Um, I miss her singing and dancing and performing. Uh, Her energy, her zest for life, even through her tragic, tragic upbringing. Before she was two and a half, she'd lost her granddad through cancer, her uncle through cancer, and then finally her, her mother through breast cancer. She had the hell of a memory she she still remembers her mum you know in the house everyone has their own little seats where they sit and she still remembers um where her mum would sit she'd say oh that you're sitting in mum's place so I'd, I'd have to move did you um have any sense of risk where you lived because you were obviously close to gaza was there any <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I've had a sense of risk since I, since I got there. I mean, her whole life she's lived there. 